this was established on the lines of the Kew's Royal Botanical Garden Society in London and its various offshoots, including in Calcutta, Bangalore, Pune, Chennai, etc. This society now has about 525 members from all walks of life. AHS has well-developed infrastructure, including meeting and training halls, sales counters, hostel facility for Malis, shared houses, an external library, and audiovisual equipment. It has close working relations with various colleges, universities, institutes, as well as with relevant government departments. My father joined the Nizam government in the year 1949 as the state horticulturist. After he joined, he began work on custard apple at the Sangareddy food process station and he managed to get successfully a seedless variety. And for the seedless variety, he was awarded the World Prize for Agriculture in 1957. Along with that, he grew table grapes for the first time on a commercial scale in the garden of late Dr. Ramakotesha Rao. And they achieved the highest yield per acre ever achieved. And Dr. Ramakotesha Rao was given the Padma Shri that year. Thereafter, in the Hyderabad uh, Numash, which is uh, most of the Hyderabadis are fond of, he started an agri-horticultural pavilion where he had competitions for vegetables, fruits, floral decoration, and various other activities, basically to popularize horticulture in the Deccan area. Dr. H. P. Singh, former DDG Horticulture ICAR, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Government of India, New Delhi, with a rare combination of scientific excellence, conscientious administration, dynamic management skills, and academic depth. Dr. Singh, in his career spanning 50 years, is a prime mover of research, development, and education in agriculture and horticulture, which has not only impacted the growth of horticulture, but has provided new dimension to agricultural education. On this occasion of second memorial lecture on L. Bhankat Ratnam, who has been my good friend before his soul departed to the heaven, as he has been described, he has been a passionate horticulturist who has significantly contributed to development of horticulture. Initially, of course, as we see the pre-independence horticulture was only a hobby and pleasantry. And after different phases of the growth, we have reached to this stage. And during that period of the transition, what I always say, the real horticulture has come with the new century, in this century. So the earlier century, after the independence, was the transition phase. New technologies were coming and so on and so on some creation of awareness over the horticulture and so on and so on. Dr. Venkat Ratnam has significantly contributed in these directions, not only in India, but also abroad. The foundation laid by him, then Andhra Pradesh, now it is Telangana, has made the horticulture to be the growth engine of economic development. I remember at the time, Chitabhav Naidu was the chief minister, McKenzie had brought the report and categorically said for the whole of the Andhra Pradesh, now it is in two parts, the development of the states can be really, economic development can really be achieved when the horticulture is as a growth engine. And thereafter, a lot of activities have been taken up. And uh, I remember at the time we supported a lot, uh, like uh, uh, in the Directorate of Horticulture, uh, establishment of tissue culture system, tissue culture laboratories was done. Then we had the uh, technologies, uh, especially for the leaf analysis and trial analysis and so on. So the development process was done. And here also, because he always collaborated, Dr. Bhagat Ratnam always collaborated with the department and what I see today also, the Department of Horticulture and Agri Horticulture Society is working as a partners for the development of horticulture. And he was so. And we came into the contact when he met me, when I was the Horticulture Commissioner. I joined as Horticulture Commissioner in 97. And he met me in 98 because at the time I had formulated a program that was called the human resource development, like uh, gardener's training, the supervisor trainings, and so on. So that three categories of the training was there. And it was as a model we wanted to establish across the country. Largely it was for Department of Horticulture, but here, when he came to me and he explained that Agri Horticulture Society is capable to do that. Then, of course, I had to agree to his proposal and the Gardener's Training Center was established at 
Agri Horticulture Society here. They did excellently well. They became the model. Because then, you know, the Hyderabad was developing. Lot of employment was generated for these gardeners. And none of them, till I was there, until he was there, I don't think that anyone who got the training in the Agri Horticulture Society was unemployed. Everybody got employment or otherwise they pulled themselves as they trained the gardener, they pulled themselves and did their own business and they were employed. So these were his activities. He wanted to see the development. He wanted to see the economic development. He wanted to see the removal of the poverty. That was his thought. He wanted to see the tree grows. He has a vision that one tree, will you believe, one tree if you plant that gives a thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars is equivalent to that. Because the amount of carbon is sequestered. It keeps the environment clean. That is more than the thousands and thousands of dollars equivalent in one tree. Which he was talking at the time about the environment, planting in the trees. He was talking. And therefore, I have chosen the topic today in his memory that is sustainable development, sustainable climate resilient and sustainable development. When you talk of the climate resilience, first is the horticulture, there are three words in this, resilience, sustainable and horticulture, challenge and opportunity of course you know. Horticulture, all of you know that. This includes all kinds of the fruits, vegetables, spices, plantation crops, honeybees, mushroom. All these are the part of the horticulture. And if you define the growing of the trees, trading until it reaches to consumer, of these crops, they are the horticulture. So even if you are a fruit merchant, you are also doing the horticulture. If you are processing the fruits, vegetables or any of that, you are also a horticulture. So the horticulture is very wide a spectrum and wide a spectrum of crop and wide a spectrum of activities are there in the horticulture. When you talk of sustainable, because this is word very commonly used, sustainable, sustainable, sustainable growth. Do you understand what is the sustainable? Sustainable means we have to use the resources without compromising that our generation are not deprived of resources what we have. It means another word, whatever the development we do, keep to the world or to your next generation better than what you found. It means if you are given, got the good environment, then you must give the same environment at least for your new generations. Otherwise, it is not sustainable. If you have acquired the, your land, if your soil, your environment, then nothing is sustainable. And so it is a very big term it requires. It will be in the terms of the social, it will be in terms of the environment, it will be in terms of all kinds of the things. Mint, ultimately you can say, you must leave the world better than you found. That is a very simple word of sustainability. When you can't get the resilience, resilience means you are shocked. Climate is changing, you are shocked. So, it is your capacity to even shock you have got. It is your capacity to get relieved of the shock, prepare yourself, adopt yourself, and change the weaknesses into the opportunities. And that is called resilience. And many times I call it a smart. So, climate change. All of you know it is a reality, it is a global phenomena. After analysis of the several IPC and all that, several committee and had analyzed and they saw that temperature is changing, planet is getting warmer because 10 years of the last 10 years has been more warmer than before 10 years. So if you look to this and what are the reasons for the changes? We are the reasons for the change. Where development has not been sustainable why? Because we used more resources than we put to them. It means our forest areas had declined, so sequestration had reduced. We have put more carbon into the environment, so the balance has changed. Do you know that whole environment, the only 78% of total environment is 78% of nitrogen, 21% of oxygen, which is very essential for you, and only 1% of the gases. And this 1% caused all the problems to us. Out of 1%, is the carbon dioxide. Then you have the methane, nitrous oxide, ozone. So they constitute only 1%. And little imbalance into this 
that makes a whole kind of the problem. We get completely vulnerable. That increases the temperature. And so the climate is changing. Of course, you must have heard that many things will come, that if climate changes, temperature increases, the even ocean will increase, so many of the civilization will go away. Well, those things are there that may happen. But I am not going into the detail of that, but this is going to impact our crops. And when it is going to impact our crops, food and nutritional security becomes the challenge. That becomes the challenge. Now, how to adapt this? Adoption is the mechanism of adjustment. So, you have to assess. First, what is needed is you must have to assess the, what kind of the change is likely to take place, how the impact will happen. Analyze them, then address. Maybe suppose, for example, I take that, yes, water is going to be a problem. So as a breeder, we must have to develop a variety which can be grown with less water. If disease is going to be a problem, then we have to develop a variety which can resist the diseases. Because with the change of the climate, disease will be there. So then we have to, all this mechanism, we have to do it. Then we can reach to the adaptations. We can adapt to this. Now I'll give you the classical examples of many of the adoptions, what has happened in the past. Many of you know that uh, grape is grown in the France, Italy and so on, highly temperate zones. The grape has been grown only in temperate zones. But it has come in India in tropical zone. And how it has been adjusted? By the doing the some kind of plant architecture management. In simple word I can say, this is the pruning and identifying the which bud is going to be fruitful. And then making them to flower. And that is the way it has happened and where Mr. Subbanam also explained that how Mr. Venkatratnam has uh, made the grape to be grown here during those days when that much of technology was not available. And thereafter, of course, a lot of things we have done. And now we know that where we can grow the grapes and how we can make them to flower. So we adjusted. So you see the more than 15 degrees Celsius we have adjusted, making the temperate crop to tropical. Similarly, if you see the cauliflower, it is also grown only in the temperate zones. Now we have developed the varieties which can resist the high temperature, low temperature, both. Earlier it was only snowball was known when it was introduced and it was grown only in the winter. In the southern part to get the cauliflower, cabbages, it was impossible. Even in Bangalore it was not grown. So either it is the north in the winter or on the hills like uh, Uti and all that it was grown. But today it has been possible to grow the cauliflower across the country. In all types of the climatic conditions we have the varieties. So again we have adjusted, adapted. Even if you take the potato. So that I can go on giving the several examples how we have adapted through the technological changes, how we have adapted to all these kinds of the situation. So if the climate changing, if you know the why it is changing, what kind of problems are going to come, then we can do that. Resilience to the climate change, that's already I have explained to you. Then we have to reduce the vulnerability. What kind of the vulnerability I have said that the more disease and pest will come. So we have to develop the varieties. Uh, water is going to be a problem. Somewhere the flood may be a problem. Somewhere high temperature may be a problem. So we have to develop the resilience to this. For example, last time we saw that uh, there was temperature, increase in temperature, all the mango started completely the ripening in the trees itself. Then marketing became a problem. Then the bagging was done. Once the bagging was done, that problem was reduced. So we have to, so that way we can change to the, we can get the resilience. Now, resilience when you talk it is not as simply only the two technologies, but you have to also look to the social. Resilience can only come if you can make a, a movement. Freedom you got because everybody was involved. If you remember the Satyagraha, and then if you remember the salt movement by the Mahatma Gandhi, he took everybody. And that was common cause. Common cause was what? Salt was eaten by everybody. So he said that, okay, we will not give the tax. And that became the movement. So he involved everybody. So here also social, economic, everything has to be involved to get the resilience. You have to create the awareness among the people. So all these factors have to come into the being. Then only you can have the real resilience. We cannot have only the technological, political will is also required to be there for the better resilience. So we have to look into that. The sustainable development, already I have explained what is the sustainable. So how we have to? 
you have to have the climate resilience, then only you will be have the sustainableness. Ensure the social and economic development. If you want to have a sustainable development, you have to ensure, then you have to reduce overuse of natural resources. Many times it is said the soil we put too much of fertilizer, soil is becoming alkaline, saline. We use in it is said that in Punjab lot of water because free water, too much of water is used, that is also harming that. So you have to bring all the changes in the manner that you have the sustainability. And to give and though ultimately you have to give more than what you got. Likely impact, likely impact would of the climate change. You see, the, as you have said, the temperature will increase. More than that, vulnerability is there. The season will change. See, suppose that your sowing date is the June, it may not happen because temperature may not be favorable. Earlier our timing was fixed based on the temperature we had for the 20, 25 or 100 years. We had fixed that June is the planting season for that. But no, now we have to change our thoughts and we have to say that when should we do the saving of the seeds when the temperature, night temperature is so much and day temperature is so much. For example, in Gujarat, we have a very short period of winter. If you want to grow the potato there, the people have to plant. If night temperature is around 20, 22 maximum and day temperature is below 30, 32. So then they go for the planting of potato rather than adopting that no, I will go for planting in the month of October as you do then in north conditions. So you have to, so that impact can be made to change. Another impact may be that your flowers that due to high temperature, pollen may dry. So fruitfulness may not be there. Your quality of fruits may get reduced. But other advantage is also there. What is the impact is there? We had a lot of studies done in coconut and we could see that under the high carbon concentrations, the coconut yield gets increased. It means, indirectly I can say that if carbon dioxide in a street of 0.063%, if it becomes 400 ppm, if I say in other way the ppm parts per million, then our yield will increase, provided our water, water is constant, then yield will increase. So the carbon is going to be beneficial. But Offsetting may take place because the water stress may be there. So we have to take care of that. Abiotic and biotic stress may be more. We have seen even if you see the viral diseases and many of diseases compared with 1940s and today you will see the four to five times increase is there in the disease of plants. Leave aside the human being, disease of plants itself has increased. And not only that, the new biotypes are coming. We have been developing a variety of potato resistant to phytophthora. And what the variety we developed about 30 years back, they have broken. The same variety which was resistant 20 years before, today it is not. Why? Because there are new types are coming in the beginning phytophthora and what we call it races, new races. So what you have developed there, so that due to this climate change, this biotic and abiotic stresses will be more. Abiotic stresses, when you say, more of salinity may come, more of the drought situation may come more of water stress may be coming and then there will be a complete disturbance of value chain. So any, any kinds of the stress if you have, the value chain gets completely disturbed. Just like you could see that in Corona, lot of value chain was completely disturbed. Now slowly we are coming back to that. Now I have already explained to you the horticulture. It includes fruits, vegetables, just graphically it has been presented to you. Now we look to the growth of the horticulture. As I explained to you, the horticulture before pre-independence was only a hobby and pleasantry. It means only jamindar, jagidars, they were having the orchards and there were some malis who were doing that, some flowers, flowers were grown for the temples and so on. So this was only a conventional type of horticulture. It was not even a science-based or technology-based. We slowly changed. Some commodity institutions were established. Say, for example, oldest uh, uh, research uh, on horticulture is in the coconut, which was started in 1916. 1916 in the Trabancore state in Kerala. Because at the time they had some problem, so they, that started. Subsequently, in 1946, that commun community was developed. 
then after the board was and then directorate was developed. Similarly, the other area, spices, research was, uh, uh, development was also taken up. But all this was before independence was negligible. I would say the only the work was, even the research work was, before that was done, some ad hoc schemes were done, where some survey, some botanical research and all that was done. Real turn took when the Department of Horticulture was established in IRI, and at the same time, there was the Institute of Horticulture was established uh, in uh, IHR Bangalore. And then, of course, you have the Plantation Crop Research Institute at Kasargod. All this when they were started, the horticulture uh, research started. So initial stage, stage, if you see the research was largely for developing propagation, some here and there for developing varieties. But with the turn of century, the horticulture has become really technology driven. Turn of the century it has completely become technology driven and that's why our horticulture production which was at the, in 1950 after the independence, horticulture production was 25 million tons and grain, fruit grain production was uh, 50 million tons. So from 25 million tons, we are always lower and lower, but last in the last decade, it's changed. Agriculture production, horticulture production became more than the crop production. So currently, of course, it is the 316 uh, around is the crop production, your grain production, and horticulture is uh, 329 or 333, something like that, two data are seen. So it has changed. So this is the way you can see the aesthetically it has continued to grow. The horticulture has continued to grow. If you see the development in the fruits and vegetables, the vegetable has grown much faster than the plantation and spices in the terms of production. Fruits has also grown in much faster, but vegetable, if you see, it has grown much faster. If you see the production and productivity, it has changed tremendously. Tremendously in the sense that we had a production in the turn of the century 1920-21, uh, 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 2001, we had a production of 145 million tons. And today we have the production of 333 million tons. Our area has not increased much. It is only 26 million hectares, which was about 14 million hectares. So about 10 million hectares, but our production has jumped tremendously. And if you look to that productivity, yes, productivity also, this all the gains has been there due to the productivity. Productivity also has increased by 40, 45%, especially in the fruits and vegetables. So this gains is not by the area, but it has gained has been by production and due to the technologies. And this may be further increased because many of the plantations of horticulture crops, especially the fruit trees, they are in the gestation period. So many of them may come to the fruiting and the further gain you may be getting. Now if you want to a driver of the growth, if you see, so the policy, investment, the development technology, for example, beside the policies, the development strategy was changed. Policy, if you see the horticulture policy changes in general in horticulture, lots of changes we made in the policies. For example, earlier the cold storage was completely regulated by the government, which has brought the free. Then we had the land aggregation laws. Now that is being changed. So this helps them to go for the, uh, you know, lease lands. So in many of the states have to adopt, but at central level, the model law has been made. Then approaches of the development, earlier it was the traditional methods, but after the turn of the century, we have come in the mission mode approach. So earlier there were three missions uh, for Northeast, for Himalayan state, but now it is for whole country, only one integrated development of horticulture. So these are some of the drivers who have really made the horticulture to grow appropriately. The technological changes, you can see the large number of technological changes has taken place. For example, cultivars. I myself was uh, analyzing myself. So, so far, more than 2,000 cultivars we have developed in the various horticulture crops. More than 2,000. And many of them are still existing in that. So, the, we have the large number of varieties that are resistant to diseases. We have the varieties which can tolerate the different temperature as explained in the cauliflower. We have the variety which can be grown in the higher temperature. The, the varieties can be grown even in the lower temperature. It can be grown on hills, it can be grown in plants, it can be grown in subtropical situations. This type of changes we have taken place in the case of tomato, in the case of uh, um, uh, even in potato. Potato was only earlier when it was the potato, if you remember it was when it was introduced, it was only introduced on hills. 
Means, means it was in Uti, it was in Silong, it was in uh, Himachal Pradesh, and it was also in Uttarakhand. So only on the hills. But again, thanks to the scientists, they developed a seed production technology. There was technology said that is called seed production technology in potato, where they identified that yes, these are the free from the aphid area during this period, so you can grow the seeds. So that that was called crop top cutting techniques, wherein that shoots were cut, so the aphids cannot take place there and they cannot transmit the viruses. And then this technology, and that technology made the seed to be produced in that place. And then the revolution has taken. Now, just from that 3 million tons at the turn of the century, we have reached to the 60 million tons of the potato being produced in our country. So that is a definitely it has changed. Anywhere if you see, they said change. And the, this is technology has been drivers. Another area is the production system management. Now we have adopted mulching, we have adopted micro irrigation, fertigations, and so on and so on. Effective disease management system. Now we have the, some forecasting model in many of the cases. We can forecast, for example, in case of potatoes, we can forecast that when that phytophthora is likely to come and you can prevent. So forecasting models we have developed. We have the, also the threshold values developed and that we can manage. Plant health we can manage, post harvest, uh, management also has improved. No doubt, many of times we say there are a lot of losses there. Losses are there, I may not say, but there is a lot of improvement. Many of the technologies has come. So that way, these are the technological changes that have taken place. We have changed from the conventional system to new system. In ca case of the flooding, irrigation was there. Now we have the fertigation, we have the micro irrigation. You had uh, earlier the spray, even a spray system, if you see, earlier a spray you used to take a lot of pesticides, but today sprayers, they can efficiently spray with minimum, they will give the maximum control. So these are the, some of the technological changes which made the horticulture to grow. These are the, some of the things you can say. Earlier when you grow this kind of varieties, it was taking 18 months, banana. And with the introduction of Grand Nan, the yield has increased many a times and it can be grown, three crops you can grow in the two and a half years, you can get the three crops and large number of farmers are there across the country who are harvesting the banana and getting the net return per acre to two lakhs rupees, means per hectare you can say five lakhs rupees net return they are getting from the banana by growing nine, nine, nine varieties. This has been another area which also gives the very uh, high returns to the people provided you take care, the pomegranates and many of the area it is being grown. Now it is the uh, date palm, which is largely in the Rajasthan and Gujarat. And now this is also a potential one. This is a potato, you can see the various potatoes varieties uh, our issues have developed. And now of course the private sector participation is there. More than eight or ten companies are there who are now doing the seed potato. Besides, it has attracted. So this is a public participation, private participation and lot of changes is taking place. You can say there is a red type of potato which is completely red. Many people have the preference for that. We have long type of potato. We have the potato which is, uh, which can be for uh, chips. There are potato which can be only for the making the finger chips. So different kinds of the potatoes, processing potatoes are different. Earlier your thoughts were that potato means potato. No, the, for different uses you have the different varieties in the potato. And so the growing system also has changed. This is the tomato, you can see what kind of the variability you have the tomatoes. We have the cherry tomato, we have small tomato, we have big tomato, you have table tomatoes, we have processing tomatoes and so on and so on. This is the technology of the planting material production. We have shifted from the general, general from sucker planting to sucre planting. This is the large infrastructure is being and India has become the largest tissue culture producer of banana in the world. These are the system. Now you can see the quality planting material. This is all mechanized system has come. Now, another area where we have made a lot of uh, dent is that is the micro irrigation. Because water is the most precious, everybody knows. And one concept you must understand uh, that we take the water uh, in glasses. It means one glass morning, then after two hours, three hours. So, in total we take uh, four to five liters of water per day or three to four liters of water per day, but we take in glasses. And if it comes to the week, it may be the 30, 34 liters of water. But in case of the plants, we put the, all the water at a time. Just imagine what can happen to us if all the water of week is put, same thing happens to the plant. Your productivity declines in the flood irrigation when you give that much of water. So that micro irrigation has become more handy. I will not go to the details because that itself will be the another area of lecture on the water. But just
just briefly I can say. There has been the earlier different methods we have developed and finally the micro irrigation which includes drip system and a sprinkler system that has become more important. And here in the sprinkler system we have the system through which the water is sprinkled around and the drip system it drips by drop by drop it goes to the root zone. This has the advantage that the drip, this drip system has the advantage that even fertilizer can be used here which you cannot do in the sprinkler system. That's why this drip system is more preferred. Now today also I was just saying that even the rice, the drip irrigation has become very successful even in case of the rice. Rice productivity can be increased by 30 to 40 percent by using the drip irrigation. These are the fertilization system. When you apply the water and nutrients together, that is called the fertilization. That is a simple way. Otherwise, we can say the technology. This is a technology which improves the yield, improves the quality, reduces the requirement of water and fertilizer. It means if you give the fertilizer through the fertilization system, nitrogen use efficiency gets increased. It means only 40 percent, but 50 to 60 percent of nutrients is good enough compared to the your broadcasting method. So it means you can save 30 to 40 percent of nutrients uh, cost on the nutrients. So this is the fertigation system. You have this is the model of fertigation. This is pomegranate. This you can see again the uh, different architectures, innovation in production system, different architecture of the plant you can see. This is another area, this we call the vertical system of production. You get land, space is declining. So now the people are experimenting with the vertical system. This is a, you can see the extra berry is being grown in this system. This is another hydroponics and aeroponics. There are two, two systems here I will explain for the many of the students are there. The hydroponics started in 1930s. It was before that it was said the need was there that in the Europe that you must grow the vegetable. So that the queen asked that uh, it is 18, in the 18th century, I am saying, the queen asked the, some of the people to grow, but they didn't succeed. Then Hogland was the first one who succeeded in developing a nutrient solution, and he grew. So that was a aesthetic type, passive. So, but this could not, that was very limited way that the hydroponics was used. It was in 1960s, then where the active hydroponics was done, where the water was flowing. Water was made to flow with the nutrients and plants was grown there. Earlier it was static means water is there just like even in the classes you must have been shown the hydroponics. So the flowing was there then slowly people got caught up that and now hydroponics especially it is commercially being used for growing up large number of vegetables especially the leafy vegetable. And this is the aeroponics. In aeroponics and hydroponics difference hydroponics means growing the plant without the soil is the hydroponics with water. Hydro and ponics means water, growing in the water is the hydroponics. Uh, aeroponics is another way with differences. Here you can see that root system is given the mist of water. It is not made to the grow in water, but mist of water and nutrients is given and it is highly successful for the production of tissue culture plants and now we are trying also in various crops. Another area of the development in the horticulture is plant architecture management. High density of planting, normally we say in pineapple, just from the 16,000, we have gone up to the 40,000 plants per hectare. Banana also, the spacing has increased. So in almost all the crops, even in case of the mango, ultra high density planting has been very successful. Even in case of the guava. And now the training system, the first trial we made in the trial we made in case of uh, uh, apple. Where on trellis, apple was made to grow. And we pruned it. And now we find that it gives the highest yield. And a Maling 9 root stock it has been grown and it is in our institute. And looking to the institute at the CIHS, uh, our CIT is there in the uh, 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 Srinagar. And looking to that, now department also has expanded that, growing the apple on the trellis, which gives the highest yield. And uh, now we have also tried in many other crops like guava, lychee, mango. It is in mango, you can see. This is right now till a date, it is giving the good yield. Means you can see that it has been trained and maybe that later on, we may not require the tallis system. It will grow on its own. And it gives that fruits and fruits can be harvested by hand, no damages. This is another ultra density of the planting I said to you. This you can see in the case of tomatoes, it is in greenhouse. So this tomato gives you the yield of 300 tons per hectare. 
You can see the yields. This is a capsicum. Now, always we talk of the precision farming. So, this is another area that this we have done already and precision farming already we done. So, what is the precision farming? Precision agriculture or precision farming is a system management wherein we observe, we measure and respond. It will be highly scientific. Suppose we say that today is a rainfall. We have observed there is a rainfall. So how much rainfall? If this is the amount of rainfall, how much water it has gone to the soil and how much will be needed. So, do you irrigate or not irrigate? So, these all the decisions are made. So, this is also called a decision support system. And so, the, you give inputs precisely. Either if you have to put the seeds, what should be the depth? If you put the little down, it may not grow. If you put little up, the plant may fall. So everywhere, everything has to be done precisely. It is a technology driven and that is the precision farming. And this is the precision horticulture. Maybe that we are, we had already precision horticulture way back in 2002. I had a big conference on the precision horticulture. And thereafter I have seen that a lot of growth has taken place in the precision horticulture. If you want to resilience the climate change, you require the precision farming. Apply precisely, apply the water precisely, use the varieties precisely. The system management you have to have, already I have explained to you, because if you want to get more income per unit area, if you want to double the income of the people, double the income of the farmers, you need to require the precision farming. You have to examine, you have to observe, and then when you see the pomegranate trees, this is just uh, of my height itself, and it is yielding so much. You can see the fruits are around. These are the, some of the examples of precision horticulture. This is the cauliflower, uh, cabbages, this is the floriculture, this is tomatoes, again tomatoes. Now, if you want to have the climate resilience, you have to address appropriately. Are we transforming? Question becomes, are we transforming? I say, yes, we are transforming. But what a speed? A speed is not so much. We must have to enhance our a speed to address the challenges. And in this, if you want to do that with all this, your precision, agriculture and all that, then you require a value chain management becomes very, very essential for us. And this calls for the value chain management to have the effective transformation. What is the value chain management? Value chain management, in matter of fact, is the adding the value at different places. And so that all the partners, all the links gets benefited. That is the value chain management. Say, for example, starting from the beginning, it means, should I grow the particular crop here or not? That is another decision to be made. Where to grow the apple, where to grow the oranges, where to grow the tomatoes, where to grow the cauliflower, it starts from here. In which soil and how to grow, which variety to grow, then from where to get, how to get. And so everywhere is value. For example, Earlier, the nursery of vegetable was beyond the thoughts of ours because everybody will grow their own nursery. But today you say that nursery has become highly commercial. You have the greenhouses, you have the germinators and the people go for that. A small trees are there in that seedlings are grown and farmers take from there. Here 100% surety is there that each and every seed will grow because each seed cost you 10 to 15 rupees. In case of papaya, each seed cost you more than 50 rupees. Because in case of papaya, it is sold at the rate of 3 lakhs or 4 lakhs per kilo. So that way, that similarly the fertilizer, similarly the water management. So all the links in the chain is addressed in a manner that everybody gets benefited and ultimately the consumer, he receives the produce at the minimum cost and best form. And that is, we call it the total value chain management, where the innovations, various innovations is needed in the value chain management which has been happening and now you can see that I had a conference done on the value chain management for the first time. Uh, it was in two, 20, 20, 2019 at Pandagar. At the time people means when I talked with people the value chain management many of people they thought it is a processing in the value chain management. No, that I explained to that it starts from the day we decide we plan to grow the crops till it reaches to the consumer that, and all the links are addressed, maybe the production system management, varietal development, nursery development, quality planning material, harvesting, trading, 
processing till reaches to consumer and all the links are there, they are the value chain management. The concept of this in the matter of fact I brought when I was developing in a mission mode approach for the horticulture. I brought at the time only the value chain management and center of excellence system also at the time I had decided but slowly of course now, now I find that lot of uh, focus is there, every department is now organizing for their value chain management. Even the Niti Aayog, they are addressing the value chain management. That way the things are changing. Challenges they have, great challenge. You have to produce more with less. It is the biggest challenge. Because water is declining, land is declining, population is increasing. So world population is going to be 9.6 or maybe the 10 billion by 2050. Even in India, maybe more than 2 billion. Already we are 1.4 and India may be beyond the 2 billion. So, from the declining land and you will require for industry, you will require for road, you will require for housing. So it means 30% of area is going to decrease. So can you produce the for increasing population with declining resources? That is a great challenge. Can you meet? This is a challenge. It is impossible but it can be made possible. Produce more with less. Produce this malnutrition. You have to reduce malnutrition because 300 million people are suffering from malnutrition. Which is causing the several kind of diseases even for the child and for the pregnant women and so on and so on. So more than 300 million people are only in India and it is uh, 500 million people maybe there in total. So we have to address that, manage the biotic and abiotic stresses that is also a, a challenge, meet the nutritional needs. Another is that there is an increasing you know income of the people, expendable income is increasing. Urbanization is going to be the more. Now if you see the currently you have around 40 35 to 40 percent of people live in the urban areas, which is likely to reach to more than 50 percent by 2050. And globally it may be more than 60 percent, but in India it will be 50 percent. So 35 to 50 percent when you move, uh, your requirements are different. When the expendable income is there, people want the quality of life, means nutritional food, the aesthetic values. These are all changes required and that puts the pressure on horticulture to produce more and that too with less. Now question is, can you? I said yes. But it requires the investment and support and technologies. Say for example, just now I showed to you that we can produce the tomato through greenhouse technology more than 300 tons. Of course, recorded value is 500 tons. But even in India we have produced 300 tons. And which is your best of the potato production outside is only 90 to 100 tons. And your average is only 40, 35 to 40 tons per hectare. So 300 tons, yes. It means six to seven times more you can produce with only by bringing the greenhouse technology, that is the technologies, bringing the fertigation system and so and so on. So possibility is there and you can do further. For example, currently with the drip irrigation system, we have 50% of saving in water. But if you go to pulse irrigation, another area is called pulse irrigation. In the drip irrigation itself, that is a pulse irrigation. So water is given in pulses. It means water is given as they demand is there from the plant and that demand is assessed based on the oxygen content in water that will be surprising to you oxygen content in water and water potential these two things are assessed by sensor when oxygen content declines little bit and water potentiality also declines water automatically comes through the system so it means the frequency of watering is only half an hour plant will be given the water at every half an hour so that the potential of water do not decline and water is taken passive movement plant do not have to exert the energy for taking the water and that we call it pulse irrigation so that system is also available besides that there are many other systems now we are talking of digital horticulture recently i had a conference in the Kanpur, we addressed a completely one session was the address of the digital horticulture. Can we do that? Yes. We can grow the plants sitting in the room. I can grow my plants. I can see my plants. I can grow my plants. Even I live in the Delhi. When I am going out to my villages, room is closed. Everything is locked. I cannot leave uh, uh, nowadays uh, the people will come and water. No. So I monitor my water through my mobile of my house itself. So that system is going to come. So that is the digitalization of that. Artificial intelligence is coming. So, I, the, my artificial intelligence will tell me that, okay, look here, your, this plant is suffering from nutrients. When I quit the data, it will say, and then I will plan to go to there, that is the artificial intelligence. Drone technology is coming, even Honorable Prime Minister has uh, had a, addressed the meetings of drone technologies. So, there are also many things, not only that you can do the imaging of that, your plants, but also you can go for spraying, watering, and so and so on. 
So a lot of technological changes is taking place. Recently, we had a very good work done with, with uh, Dr. Parihar, who has been the actually remote sensing expert. And myself as a horticulturist, we plan to look into the, some banana fields and try to see that imagery uh, data we got from uh, remote sensing data we got it. And then we analyzed and then we looked to the field. So sitting it in Hyderabad, uh, Ahmedabad, he could tell these are the fields which is, which is lacking the, some kinds of the problems that you have to look into. So that is that these are the changes is taking place. So putting the IT, putting your knowledge together and getting it integrated, big data. Some of the people are talking here also the big data. So that will be required. So that are the changes. So these challenges can be addressed. Now this is the challenge already I have told you. We have grown, of course, no doubt, we have grown very well. If you look from the 2021 or even if 1996 onwards, we have the data available. We have reached to the almost 333 million tons. But our challenge is very big. As the farmer, doubling the farmer uh, um, uh, income, the committee headed by the Dalvai, he suggested that by 23, we must reach to 451 million tons. So that is the challenge, believe we reach. But I am hopeful, yes. Then almost 700 million tons of the horticulture produce will be required by 2050. Can we achieve? Of course, the growth rate, if you see, it is hardly the 3.5% you require. And we have grown in this decade almost at the rate of 5.9% uh, uh, we have grown during the decade, last few decades. So that is not impossible. But all this will require a lot of investment, commitments, policy, environment. So conclusion, you can say the climate is the reality. It is going to impact all our system. Weaknesses, weaknesses requires to be converted into opportunity through the policy environment and so on. And if you don't do so, if you don't do so, then it is likely going to be a problem. We cannot feed the population. People may suffer across. And that's why it requires to be addressed more appropriately. Before I thank, I would like to share my few of the thoughts with you. My journey of the 50 years, starting my career in 1972. My observation is, nothing is impossible, everything is possible. <laughs> Once again, I thank all of you and all the audience, students, faculties, to everybody, I thank for the present hearing. Thank you very much. The potential in Telangana is presently oil palm, the edible oils. Argentina is consuming per capita 53 kg oil per annum and this US and UK is consuming near about 32-33 kg per annum per, per capita. Whereas in Telangana and India we are consuming in Telangana 16 kg and in India 19 kg per annum per person. Though we need a lot of oil, there is a deficit of the oil, 60% of the consumable edible oils is the only oil palm. So the oil palm is having very bright future for the Telangana to convert the paddy lands to the hot oil palm crop. Thank you very much for making this a real great success. Thanks to one and all. Thanks from PJTSAU and AHS. Thank you so much.